such a beautiful day to worship the Lord, and we also know that the Spirit of the Lord is so gracious to us. Amen. You realize that we have four new sisters, four new daughters of this family sitting in this building, and we also have two new sons. What a blessing. What a blessing. I'm it's just exciting to see Mike Howard express that this morning, the joy that he has in the gift that God has given him and the gift that he gives to others. What a wonderful blessing mm -hmm. it is to be the family of God. Amen. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, what a God you are. It's just amazing to us that we have a brother that would come to this earth, your only begotten son, that would allow us to be chosen to be adopted into his family, that we can be joint heirs, <clears throat> that we can be sons of the king, that we can be sons and daughters of God. We give you the praise. Thank you so much for being family. Thank you so much for the family here at Golden Strip. Thank you for the children. Oh, we have so many children. Thank you for Katie and the safe trip with her beautiful baby. Thank you for the Petersons and Makai as they're traveling today that you would be with them. What a wonderful thought it is to just simply say, we have family and we know we can depend on each other as we depend on a father in you that is the only father who's above us all, in us all, and is able to give to us everything that we need and knows all of our needs. Father, we simply say thank you. Thank you for Jesus and the great gifts that we have in him. And in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 If I get this thing started up. <coughs> There it goes. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, it's a beautiful chapter dealing with the Spirit of God and dealing with the coldness of the law. In the coldness of the law, it was a letter written on stone. But the Spirit of God has written His Word on our hearts with His finger. It's a beautiful thought. And as I think of the liberty that we just celebrated, the liberty of 243 years of the liberty and freedom we have in this country. I am proud to be an American. I am proud to be in a country that I can worship God freely according to God's way. But more than that, <clears throat> I am proud to say as a child of God that God's given me something. He's given me freedom beyond my imagination. He has given me liberty beyond what I can believe. In the New English, it simply says, Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and they that, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The King James uses the word, there is liberty. Either one of those words are just beautiful. Mm -hmm. To be free from sin, to be free from guilt. <coughs> I often say that the first principle of one-on-one -on -one Christianity is to be able to let go. To wake up one day and realize that I have been cleansed, justified, and washed by the fountain that flows from heaven, the blood of my Savior, Jesus Christ. What a personal thing it is to recognize and to realize the power of simply being a part of the family of God. What a wonderful blessing. You know, as I think of the family, I realize something. My mom and dad are dead. Their stuff is still in their house. Their pictures are still hanging on the wall. Mama died over 14 months ago. <coughs> 16 months ago, if you'll be accurate. I have a hard time breaking that house up. Brenda and Joy and Tiny will tell me, need to do it. And I go up there and look and I say, boy, I'm going to take that picture down right now. You know, because of this connection. But I realized something. Home is not <clears throat> that house. Mom and dad's spirits, not there anymore. But I can feel it. I walk in the room and I can actually see mom and dad sitting in their chairs. Dad had an arm chair like this. And he sat there every day in it. Tony's already put dibs on that. 
If I give it away, <laughs> but it's still there. <laughs> and she, it's sitting there. And, it, and I, I can still see him sitting there. And I realized something. Home is not that chair. Home is not that house. Home is not those pictures. Home is where my heart is. You know, when I find the liberty that I have in Jesus Christ, I realize that the last three times that I've spoken to you, I've spoken to you that we're the family. I spoke to you at, at, at the same time that the family can grow, that our Father has mansions, our Father is wealthy, our Father owns everything, and Jesus is going to prepare room for me. That I have a heavenly home, not this old body. In 2 Corinthians chapter verse 1 simply tells me, this is a tent. I got a mansion. Which would you rather live in? A tent or a mansion? I'll take the mansion any day. You take the tent if you want to. You know, I understand that. And as I look at this picture, I see family. I see a home. But where's the house? Where's the roof? But I can see love all around that table. You know what it tells me? It tells me that brethren in the early 20th century were baptized in the cross down on old Anderson Mill Road in Spartanburg. They didn't have a building. You know what they did? They put up four sticks when it was raining, the sun was up, and they put brush over it. You know what they called that? And the first time I heard it, I said, what in the world is that? They called it a brush harbor. You know? I said, what's a brush harbor? They said, they keep sun off it. You know, we got a beautiful meeting house. But I'm going to tell you one thing I've told you in all of these sermons, including even one on Esther, where we got a father that cares about us. We don't even have to hear his name, but we know he cares about us. My dad used to say, son, when I'm gone, all you got to do is shut your eyes, and I'll be there. And he is. I don't know how, if you lost your mom and dad how it is, but can you shut your eyes, and there's mama, there's daddy. Poor little Michael, his mom was way off in West Virginia, but he shuts his eyes right now. You know what he can see? He can see mama. He can see home. <coughs> he can see the sincerity of simply saying, I belong. I'm family. I am somebody, not because of what I have, what I wear, not because of the color of my skin, not because of my gender. I'm somebody because I'm family. You know, I, I've talked to a lot of people who didn't have the blessing I had. My blessing was real simple. My mom and daddy, from the time I was born, were faithful Christians. I can remember my mom and dad both praying over me when I was sick. I can remember them reading and studying the Bible with me. I can remember when I sat down at the table, they were there. They were there. But they taught me another lesson. Family's big. You know, I look around, there's Todd. Todd's my son. Eddie's going to be my grandson. I always feel like he's my grandson. You know why? It's real simple. He's family. He's family. We share together. He shares the greatest gift that God could ever give me. And that's somebody who unconditionally loves me. Oh, they all love me. I wouldn't say a word about any of these over here. The Sarah Beth, that's a whole different story. <laughs> and you can talk to her about it. You know. And I love all my grandkids and all my family. And I know you do. The family is important. Our deacon is in charge of worship. You know what he says? We're not going to call this the assembly room anymore. We're not going to call this the auditorium anymore. I'd like to call it the family room. You remember, Larry? Why is it the family room? We're the family. This is home. But wait a minute, is home in this meeting house? Is home there? Home is where the heart is. Home is where the heart is. You know, when I began to study the scriptures, I realized doing the will of the Father is so important. My daddy taught me that. My daddy believed a simple principle of the Old Testament. And as you spread a rod, you spoil a kid. And my daddy did that. But then my dad would hug me. And the last day that I was with my dad and he was conscious, he reached up and kissed me. Some people have a problem with that. I have a problem missing that kiss. It's a big, important part to me. 
And a lot of these people sitting out here had a kiss from Papa Dub, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when you consider family, it's so important. But doing the will of the Father. I remember my dad bought an old farmhouse, and he wanted to get us out of the mill village into the farm. And he says, what we need to do is we need to sell this place and get us another. So he bought a little house. That's the house I was talking about. And off we went. He was about 40 years old and run down. And I can still remember him coming out one day talking, I wished I had time. Dad, Dad go work for son. Came up, and he got off work when the son was already down. He's a hard-working man. And I can still remember what he'd say. He said, if I just had time, that rain wash has come around by the foundation of this house. I'd get my wheelbar and go down in the field and dig up some dirt. And I'd fill it up. I was a preteen, so I, could, I won't do the will of my father. So here I go down into the field, into the pasture where the cows are, and here I start digging that ground. It was hard. It had grass on it. And I dug, and I must have carried 500 wheelbars in the next two days while Daddy was at work and filled it in and raked it down. And I was so proud. So Saturday morning he got up, and for some reason he didn't have to work that Saturday. He got up, and he went out, and he'd come back in. and said, I can't believe the washed area is filled up. Who did that? I said, I did it, Daddy. And I can still feel his hand patting the top of my head, about right here, <laughs> patting the top of my head and said, good job, boy. You know, that felt so good. That felt so good. You know, to get the approval of the Father and do his will is so important. In John, the first chapter, it says that those that do the will of the Father are enabled to do something. Jesus enabled those that do the will of the Father to become sons and daughters of God. Just like these six in this week that are part of this family. You just stop and you realize to be empowered with such a power that I can become a son of the King, a son of the most holy God, the Almighty, the most powerful, the Creator of everything that I can see and know and be. It's so awesome. Amen. Without a doubt. But to feel the approval of the Father is so good. So I decided I'd done so good the next week they were out cleaning out the ditches down our dirt road, which is now clean, down our dirt road to our house. And they were cleaning them out and down getting ready to paint. Well, they was getting all this good soil, and I just remembered the week before all that wood bar loading that I was carrying up there and all the work I was doing, I was less than 12 years old. So I decided, good thing, I'm going to go out there and talk to those truck drivers. So I went out there and said, can you get me a couple loads of that and dump it down here just below where I was working? I said, oh, sure. we got to find somewhere to do it. So they dumped it. Red clay. <laughs> right by the back door steps. <laughs> Couldn't get out of the door steps because here's the door step in and there's the clay. That high. Uh -huh. Daddy come home that week. He wasn't pleased at all. How we gonna get that moved? We don't have we don't have a bulldozer. So here I go. Moving the dirt. I got him moved. But you know what? I felt his wrath. He didn't whip me. But I felt like he was dissatisfied. I didn't like that at all. Now, I don't know how you feel about your relationship with God, but when he's happy with me. Oh, I feel good. When I've done something that's not too bad, I feel bad. But to have the freedom of the blood of Jesus Christ to keep on cleansing me from that guilt, it is a great, great blessing. It's beyond what I could have ever even imagined. So when I read the scriptures, and the scripture says the Spirit gave the word, and I want to tell you something, the word's not made up by some men. And who said that? Peter, right? He talked about being on the holy mountain in 2 Peter 1. You know what he says? It is not given by private interpretation or private delivery, but where did it come from? It came from God. It came from the Spirit. And when Jesus said, do the will, and you get that, I said, well, I need somebody to help me out. And all of a sudden, my brothers was always good to me. They were older than me. They were always good to me, especially my older brother. And they got out there and helped me shovel that dirt. They helped me shovel it. Before, they didn't help me. They started helping me with that. It felt pretty good. I got some help. You know, it feels good when your brothers and sisters help you. You know, when you got a project and you're making daddy happy and all of a sudden everybody joins in and all we say is daddy's going to be happy. And so we got that dirt moved. That made me feel good. That's the idea of doing the will of the Father. 
You know, as I consider the idea of me, I realize something. A house is a house, and a home is a home. A church is a church, and a building is a building. A principle I've taught in all the other three lessons I've taught this year is, is simply this. <coughs> church is something to be. It's not a place to go. And it's not a building. These lights, that wall, this carpet, these comfortable seats, that's not the church. <coughs> you and you and you and you and you and you and six more brick this week. Amen. Make up the church. Amen. The congregation in Golden Street. And so I read this verse. You yourselves like living stones. We're talking about a spiritual house when we're talking about the church. Not a meeting house. A spiritual house. Or being built up as a spiritual house. And when I read the other words of Peter, you know what he says? After he said, God, man didn't make us up. This is coming from the Spirit of God. In the in first chapter, that second chapter in, in the first book, he makes it so, so simple. You know what he says? He says, you're a royal priesthood. Hey, hmm. I'm a priest, but I'm a king. I'm a priest, but the king, all of a sudden, kind of blends together, doesn't it? Not only am I royalty in the spiritual world, but I am also a be ability as a religious leader, access to call on the Father. Now, my dad was always accessible. I don't know how yours was. My dad was always there. In the middle of the night, when I was frightened, I could go in his bedroom and crawl in the bed and he'd scoot over to make room for me. Best place in the house. I don't know if you ever had that experience, but if you hadn't, you should have. It's a good place to be. Because you feel secure. You feel protected. And I believe that's the way the family of God, the church of Jesus Christ, the church should be. But he builds you up. You know, I look around and the world wants to tear me down. Sometimes people say, I'm a Christian, but my job is to destroy you, tear you down, pull you down, make you feel like garbage. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I've had some brethren that really treated me bad. In preaching 40 years, I've had people burn their head, trying to put out cigarettes, and they won't even know they're smoking. I drove up on them. <laughs> I've had people uh, that be cursing, and I turn around and I walk in the room, and all of a sudden it gets quiet, and reverent. <coughs> I've had people call me reverend and pastor and all kind of man of the call statements. I'm just a man. No more. I'm just a brother. I'm just part of the family. <coughs> you know. What I'm saying that for is the world tends to reverence this stuff. <coughs> when they hear your preacher, when you hear your leader in the church, but sometimes the brethren don't. That's not the way the family should be. Brothers and sisters and siblings always disagree, it seems like, even though Mackenzie loves Brad. <coughs> yeah, I don't know if you know it, Brad is in the military. He's serving way away from her. And you know, McKenzie believes Brad walks on water. So if he ever gets to ship overseas, he don't have to worry about drowning because he can walk on water. Right, <laughs> <laughs> McKenzie? She loves her brother. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Now, do, do we all feel that way about Sister Torito over here? No. Aren't we supposed to feel the same about her? Aren't we supposed to love her with the same love? The same compassion? The same concern? When the body fitly forms together, then it's that spiritual house that God intended. <clears throat> oh, we got a beautiful building. We got people that are going to tell us how to make it better. <clears throat> and that's good. And the church is sacrificing and money's coming in, so we probably will be able to make it better. Always making it better, more people, more family, bigger rooms. Why? Because we want more people to go to heaven with us. We want more people to become disciples. But to build a spiritual house comes within each one of us. There's an expression we don't hear in the Lord's church, but we hear it in religion, that Jesus is my personal Savior. I don't know how you feel about that. But I wish more people would say that. 
I'm personal with Jesus Christ. He's my brother. I love him. Oh, he's my Savior. He gave it all for me. He didn't have to come from heaven. He didn't have to give up all that he gave up for me. I didn't deserve it. I was a sinner. While I was yet a sinner, he died for me. Oh, I can imagine that. I remember one time a, a, a larger dude was going to try to beat me up as I was getting off the bus, which I didn't ride much to school. Dad and Mom provided other transportation. <clears throat> I remember my big brother was meeting me out there, David. This kid's fixing to hit me. David stepped in front of him. He said, hit me first. Kid left. And that felt good. Not because my brother was going to hit somebody else, but because my brother loved me enough to put himself between me and danger. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Isn't that the way God intended? We family. We understand family. You know, in Ephesians 4 chapter, it talks about family, and it says simply this. It's a simple term. You know what it says? You understand husbands, wives. Then you understand Jesus in his church. But I'm only going to tell you about husbands and wives because you understand that. You know, how you're willing to stand up for your wife. She's part of you. He goes through all that. And at the end, he says, now, I'm not talking about husbands and wives here. I'm talking about the church. He's talking about the, the mystery of Jesus and his church. Well, once we understand the concept, the church is family. It's a spiritual house. It's not a place to go, but it's something to be. I'm family. And all of a sudden we understand that. It becomes simple. It's the simplicity. It's, as Paul wrote to the Corinthian church of Jesus Christ. It's just that simple. You know, we got about 30 more minutes and we're going to get, we're the assembly. He talks about assembly. <coughs> Now, my expressions, your may, may be different. When I talk about coming here, I don't talk about going to church. You know what I talk about? Going to assembly, going to worship God, going with the church to worship God. This, this building's incidental to me. I heard Eric say one time in the elders meeting, I can worship across the street in broad sunlight, beating down on my head or rain, either one, as long as the brethren are together around there, and I can praise God just as good as I could over here. Not what you said, right, Eric? That's the way it is. When you're family, you know, it's important. You know, if Brad was to come to town this afternoon, Ken, McKenzie would not have a problem finding him and getting to him quickly. And if Michael can't keep up, he can stay home. <laughs> we understand that concept, don't we? That's family. No, it's the assembling together. Don't forsake it. Don't forsake it. It's like forsaking your family. That's like forsaking your mom and daddy, your brothers and sisters. We misunderstand that concept sometimes. It's a duty. No, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. The church is the body of Christ. You know where the blood flows? I've heard this expression. I've said this expression a lot of times. If Gary was to all of a sudden have a pool of blood around him and it's running out of his body, what would we do? Safety team, get over here. <laughs> We'd be in a hurry, wouldn't we? Why? Because the blood's supposed to flow in the body. Now I'm going to ask you a simple question. Where does the blood of Christ flow? Out of the body? In the sense... That it's just poured out on the ground. <coughs> no, he said, he said people don't want to assemble and do willful sin that they try it underfoot. They try to get it out of the body. But that's not where it is. The blood's in the body. Why? Because life is in the body. Life is in the blood. Why? Because God put it there. I didn't. But God put it there by another use. The body of Christ in Ephesians, I wish you'd read it sometime, just go through. The body of Christ, how it's the fullness of God, it's the the, the purpose of God is one. It's Jesus, is, Jesus is there for the body. He loves the body. He gave himself for the body, which is the church in Ephesians 5. And we could spend weeks talking about Ephesians and the body of Christ. But you're going to have to do that on your own personal study. The body of Christ is the eternal purpose of God. In Ephesians, third chapter, it just says it straight up. We're not going to be able to read it. It's the eternal purpose of God. Eternal it's not that God started it and he made a mess out of things. And so he came up with a new idea while Jesus was on earth. We're going to start this thing called the church. And Jesus go build a church. No. It was his eternal purpose. Eternal is no beginning and no end. As the Bible says, before the foundations of the world. God decided this. Why did God decide it? I have no idea. 
No more than I understand the introduction to God to say with man and woman and children and all that. But you know, I know something. God needs our love. You know, I can take my smartphone and I can program that thing with Tanya's help, Sarah Bell's help, <laughs> Amy's help, anybody I can find. You know what that thing will tell me every day? I can mash a button and Siri get on and say, I love you. You're just beautiful. You're sweet. You're kind. You're just awesome. I love you with all my heart. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I can get to do that every day at a certain time. There's a lot of mechanical devices or, or devices that I'm totally ignorant about that can do that. Every day. That's not love. That's not love. God could have programmed us to make us love Him. He's almighty. You know what He chose to do? Give us a choice. Do what your choice is? Decide to love Him or not. To be submissive to Him. Like, like I was to my own dad. The eternal purpose of God is simple. You know what it is? The church. The family. The house of God. Oh, I just skipped something. <laughs> Which it already is. The house of God. You know what the house of God is? It's not a house. It's the habitation. The house of God is used in Ephesians, the second chapter, in many translations. In some translations, it uses the word habitation. That's where he lives. You know where God lives? He lives in you. He don't live in this building. I heard somebody say, this is the sanctuary. God is here. You know, it took Solomon forever to get God to move into the temple on a temporary basis with tens of thousands of sacrifices begging God. God said, I'll stay there as long as the people obey. There's some this. Didn't take him long to move out, did he? Got burned down, tore down, destroyed, all the way down to when Titus, the Roman general, came through and completely annihilated. You know, you stop and you realize the house of God. We are in the house of God. Not this building. But you, family, house of God, the temple of God, it's the holy temple. I said, it ain't nothing like knowing that I am a priest in the house in the temple of God. According to Revelation 1, it simply says, by the blood of Jesus, I've been made a king, and I've been made a priest. I have a high priest. I like that. As a preacher, I always had a little problem. People come up whispering stuff in my ear, and I'm trying to tell you guys what it said. So a lot of times I just say, get up and tell them. <clears throat> and somebody get up and tell them. And what they, were going, what they end up telling them that they wanted to be prayed about was totally different than what I heard. I said, that probably was good that I did that because they would have been misunderstanding. And I know Michael said the same thing, where people whisper in your ear, you're not sure exactly how to convey that to the audience. But you know, confess your faults one another and pray one for another is a fact. But there's another thing. As a child of God, I can confess my faults to Jesus. And he's faithful, according to 1 John, to do what? To forgive me. Forgive me. I'm not perfect. But I'm a born-again Christian that has access to the Father, to the Holy Temple, which I am. <coughs> we can spend a lot of time talking about 1 Corinthians and that, that, that I've been bought with a price. We can use a lot, of time, a lot of time talking about I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. It says it right there. My body is. I don't have to wonder about it. The church is the church of God. He purchased with his own blood in Acts 20. It's the church of Christ. The church is of Christ salute you in Romans 16. 16. Jesus said, I will build my church. It is the first born of the Lord. Jesus came from the grave, never to die again. And you know what? The family of God, the church, the body of Christ, the temple of God that we are, you know what our hope is? That I'll never be separated from God again. I will never have to die. I can be in his grace and his kindness and his forgiveness. As Michael preached last week in such a powerful way. You know, the great assembly of God. That's one thing to assemble here. But I want you sometime to read Hebrews the 12th chapter about the great assembly of God. It's got a bunch of angels in it. And it's got Moses in it. And it's got Abel in it. Oh man, this assembly is a big one. It's got the church of the firstborn in it. Oh, you mean I'm going to be in the same place that Moses and Elijah and Jesus and God and all Abraham? Oh my goodness. Can you imagine being at the mountain of transfiguration where Peter said, this is a holy mountain? Look, there's, there's Moses and Elijah. Let's make temples. And oh, we had to be brought back down. But can you imagine, not just those two, 
But everybody has done the will of God and loved him forever. He has a common faith with me. And there they are. And you know, that I heard some this past week, it says the weather report this week on, on, on church side. And the weather report was this. The sun, S-O-N, shines all the time, every day. I like that. I like that. It really, it really was great. So we go through all these many descriptions of the, of the church, the body, the family, the house of God, all these metaphoric descriptions, but it comes down to simply one thing. We are the church. We are followers of Christ. We are Christians. We are the family of God. The family of God is something to be. It's not a place to go. I wish it was. Because I go to 215 Elm Drive, and there we be. My family of old. But I'm glad I'm in this church family and you're here. And my physical family's here. What a blessing. That our children can be of like precious faith. What a blessing. God is good to us. And God blesses us. Now when I consider what I've said today, oh, one thing will stay with you forever. And that is this. Be a Christian. Be a child of God. Be the church. Don't worry about going to it, but when you be that, you know what you want to be? You want to be with other family. You want to be not just a brick, but you want to be the structure. You want to have the assembly. You want to have the support. You want to have the siblings. You want to have the connection. What a connection we have in Jesus. In Galatians, the third chapter, the Apostle Paul simply puts it this way. He says, we're all the children of God by faith. For as many of us have been baptized and put on Christ. It is according to the promise that he made to Abraham. Praise God. If you're in a lost state, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? I missed you. I thought I could learn you. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that our unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other.